Um, I guess I'll just stand here. Um, I have no slides. Uh, I don't know if I should do my slides. Um, so I want, my name is David Teller. Uh, I'm at the uh, University of California, Berkeley. I'm a journalist and I also have a public health degree. Um, I don't speak Dutch, I'm sorry, I'm talking English. Um, I got interested in uh, writing about uh, ME CFS a number of years ago when a friend of mine I've known for a long time got quite sick. He's been sick for 25 years now. Um, and I always knew that uh, I could see he was being mistreated by the health care system and it was always clear to me uh, he needed uh, medical treatment and not psychotherapy and not exercise therapy. Um, he didn't have a psychological problem that was making him sick. He was sick. Um, and so when the PACE trial came out, I started looking at it and I just got uh, increasingly uh, dismayed at what seemed to be all the mistakes they had made in the trial. Uh, I'm just curious how many of you actually know much about the PACE trial? Raise your hand. How many of you know nothing about the PACE trial? Okay. So the PACE trial um, was conducted by British psychiatrists uh, starting in 2003. They got funded by the UK government agencies. The goal was basically to prove that what they were doing was already, uh, was, was true, was the good thing to do. They were already providing cognitive behavior therapy and graded exercise therapy for patients. That were the um, main recommendations in the UK. And the study was set up by the people who had promoted that idea, basically to prove what they were doing was accurate. Um, when the study came out in 2011, in The Lancet, the first paper from the study, it was clear immediately to patients that everything had changed from what they said they were doing, that the study was absurd, that it was meaningless findings, um, and yet it was published in The Lancet. And all the coverage in the UK and around the world was about recovery. Um, and these were very prominent. Oh, let's put the lights down. These were very prominent psychiatrists, so the the, the, the uh, study got a lot of attention. And again, the Lancet is one of the two or three main medical journal, uh, top medical journals uh, in the world. So if something's published in the Lancet, it's considered true, accurate. Um, so this study became very influential uh, in the UK, uh, especially, and here I know as well. Um, uh, the um, British psychiatrists have good friends and their Dutch colleagues, psychiatrists, uh, who have also taken on this ideology. And it really is an ideology or, uh, you know, because it's not like a religion, because it's not actually based on any, you know, reality. I personally think all religions are cults, and so I think any science also based on no facts is also sort of like a cult. So they've developed the cult of cognitive behavior therapy and graded exercise therapy as treatments for this illness. Um, the study is flawed in many ways that make it really, it should never have been published. Um, one of the first things they did was that um, when you publish a study, you're supposed to publish a protocol. You do a protocol which basically lines, uh, lays out all the things that you're going to do, details. That's what gets approved by your ethics committees and all the people funding your study. Now, you're not supposed to change everything when you publish your paper. You can't just change what your outcomes are because you didn't like the original outcomes you chose. If you have to do that for some reason, there are certain statistical things you have to do to show that your new results actually are real results and not just ones that you made up. They didn't do that. They changed their primary outcomes in ways that made it much easier for them to declare success. And they changed their entire definition of what they called recovery Again, they had four criteria for what they called recovery that you have to meet. All four of them were weakened, so it was much easier to get to recovery. Even with all that, they had very poor results. Um, other things they did, so that by itself should make the study unpublishable. They changed their primary outcomes, that's called outcome switching, and they did no statistical analyses to show that they didn't pick new outcomes just to make better results. That's what you're supposed to do. They didn't do that. That should never have been published. 
Um, they uh, had no, all their objective outcomes failed. So they had a walking test, they had a step test, they had measurements of who got back to work, who got off benefits, they all failed. None of them showed any, the one showed very minor improvement for the exercise arm, but it was not really, uh, 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 people were still severely disabled even though they got slightly better. So basically none of their objective measures, uh, which they had promoted in their protocol as very necessary to back up their subjective measures, uh, none of their objective measures were successful. So the only things they were left with were a subjective statement that people were less fatigued and a subjective statement that they could do more. But since all their objective measures failed, it doesn't actually seem like anybody could do more or anybody was less fatigued. It was just a subjective thing that the, they were able to say during the, during the trial. Subjective findings are very, very, very subject to, to bias and influence from outside. Now, what the researchers did in order to uh, presumably maybe make more influence on the findings was they published a newsletter during the trial in which they promoted cognitive behavior therapy and graded exercise therapy as having been selected by the government as effective therapies. They also published in this newsletter uh, testimonials from a half dozen very happy participants in the trial who said they had gotten much better. Um, you can't do that. You just cannot do that. And when I've taken the study, and I've shown it to my colleagues at Berkeley, and they look at it, and they're like, what? They, they're, they're kind of beside themselves. And it's really astonishing that a paper with these flaws can get, could get published. Um, among the other things they did, uh, as we know, they're all uh, consultants. They work for disability insurance companies. They work for disability insurance companies advising them that uh, patients with uh, MD, CFS, need to, before they can get any benefits, need to have exercise therapy or cognitive behavior therapy. And they make this recommendation based on their totally stupid, meaningless science. Now, when you're, they, they uh, promised in their protocol that they would tell all their participants of all their conflicts of interest. But on their consent forms, they didn't tell anybody. They didn't tell participants. Now, if you look in the Lancet, it says there are conflicts of interest, but they promised in their protocol to tell the participants. When this was raised with them, their answer is, well, we disclosed it in the Lancet. But that's not an answer. If you promise to disclose to participants in the process of obtaining informed consent, you can't just decide not to do that. They made a lot of decisions after publishing their protocol, which totally violated their protocol. Again, you cannot do this in science. Now, obviously you can and get it published because they did, but it's very, very wrong. And without having informed consent from all their 641 participants, none of their papers should have been published. So even if their findings were totally accurate, which they're not, none of the papers really should ever have been published because they have no legitimate informed consent for any of their participants. That's a shocking, shocking, dereliction or you know lapse, ethical lapse. And they've managed to get away with this for years. Um, I've taken it upon myself to try to stop this um, because uh, you know I'm not personally sick, but I've obviously talked to a lot of people. Uh, my heart breaks, I watch this movie, I, I, I hear people's stories. It's horrible. I don't need to tell you. Um, but as you know, it's very hard for people outside to understand what you're all experiencing. Um, when I was working on, there are there you know, some other problems with the study, but those were sort of some of the main ones. And basically the problems are such that the study should never have been published. Um, and these people really, really have a lot of misery to answer for. Um, I decided that what I needed to do to get attention for what I was doing um, now, if some of you have read my work, it's all being published on Virology Blog. I'm sure none of you have ever heard, it's not the New York Times, it's not, you know, a major media, whatever. I couldn't find anybody who wanted to publish my work, because editors are the same as everybody else. It's very complicated, they don't understand it. Um, so I, you know, did this stuff story and I have a colleague at Columbia University and he has this blog and he's interested in the issue. 
So I published it there. What was important to me in the story, and sure, making sure, trying try to make sure it had impact, was that I really needed to bring in scientists, researchers, not in the fields, who hadn't looked at the study before, who had come to it fresh, but who were recognized as experts, and would say, this is a piece of shit. You know, this is nonsense. And make sure that those quotes were very high prominent in my story. And that's what I did. So I, I did talk to Ron Davis from Stanford, who's obviously very credible. Uh, I got a colleague of mine from Berkeley, uh, in the, an epi uh, head of epidemiology in the School of Public Health, who had never looked at the study before, but thought this is absurd. Um, I got a, 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 the guy whose blog I published on. He's not connected, but he agrees the study is terrible, needs to be retracted. I found another biostatistician at Columbia, very expert, who also said this is, this quote was my favorite, he said, this is the height of clinical trial amateurism. <laughs> now, it's very, very difficult to get scientists to speak that way about other people's work, unless it's really terrible. Scientists don't want to go around criticizing other scientists unless they're personally involved in a dispute or they have a personal expertise in that area. So it's very striking that these well-known scientists would say this thing about a study that they're not at all connected with, all they look at is they see a study that's terribly, terribly flawed. And that really helped, I think, get a lot of traction. So when the stories came out, they started getting some coverage, and uh, we were able to round up uh, a lot of the researchers. So two weeks ago, we published an open letter to The Lancet with 42 signatures of well-known researchers and, and the ECFS clinicians. And I know that the Lancet and the Pace authors are nervous about what I've been doing. They're very aware of it. Um, they're very aware that their answers are unacceptable. Um, they published a response to my stories. They wouldn't talk to me before, of course. They said their work speaks for itself. I think their work speaks very loudly for itself, just not in the ways that they think it speaks for itself. Um, their responses were totally inadequate, and my response to them pointed out that their responses were inadequate. So they're very aware that this is going on. There's a lot of pressure on them now. Uh, there are several requests for data. Um, there's a court hearing in April in, uh, in the UK about one of their requests for data. They have no grounds for not uh, releasing data, except grounds that, is, uh, grounds that they make up that are, that are absurd. And what that's done is that it's brought into the situation a lot of people who are interested in the issue of trial transparency and open access to data. So that's a big movement in science now to share data. And they're violating it, and that's brought more people into it. So I feel like over the next year, there's going to be some real movement in getting rid of this trial. Um, and I hope, I hope that that will have an effect in Netherlands, in Denmark, in Germany, in other places where um, people have been sort of captured by this uh, cult of cognitive behavior therapy and graded exercise therapy. I have to be careful when I talk publicly because I am so enraged and I am very liable, of, uh, capable of saying extremely defamatory and libelous statements about these researchers and I need to restrain myself because I don't want to be sued, although probably if I was sued that would actually be a lot of media attention and would actually make things move faster. <laughs> so in a way I would like to be sued, but in a way I don't want to. Um, but, but I mean really, it's impossible not to sort of you know, I, I can say their trial is, is flawed and meaningless, and I can prove that in court if I have to. So I'm, you know, I, I try to stay away from talking about their motives, even though I can speculate very well about what their motives might be, and 